Welcome back. This is a Tutor Wizard. I'm Adrian. Please subscribe right here. Hit the notification bell. You'll get notifications for this series and a bunch of others on our channel. We're doing Linear Algebra 1. This is Chapter 2 Matrices. 2.1 is Introductory Definitions and Operations. This lecture, what we're going to do is addition, scalar multiplication, the zero matrix, and if you know where we're going this, we're trying to make a vector space out of the set of all matrices and these two operations. So we need a zero and we need the guy one from scalar multiplication you're familiar with. And we're trying to create a vector space structure for the set of all n by n matrices over the real numbers. Okay, the first couple of definitions are the set of all m by n matrices is going to be denoted by m, m by n, r. Most of the time we're going to use the same ambient field r, so we're not going to change that, so we'll write m, m, n. And in particular, we're going to talk about square matrices in a lot of the problems. So if m is equal to n, then we write the double equals means by equals by definition also all the way through in any text. And so we'll just write m, n is the set of all n by n matrices. What we're going to do is, for every m and for every n, we're going to take these two oper linear operations and create a structure called a vector space structure for this object with addition and scalar multiplication, and then two special guys called the zero and the scalar identity. One of them you've seen before, the number one, and one of them you may not have seen before, the zero matrix of size m by n. Let's do a quick example of this and then give the structure of what we, how we build this thing with these two operations into a vector space. All right, example one, let A be the two by two matrix zero, one, two, three. Those are actually Fibonacci numbers. And let B equal seven, five, three, two. Those are the first four prime numbers in some order. Let's compute A plus B. Let's compute two B or not two B. Two B we'll compute. And then we'll compute A plus two B for the first one, solution. Let's compute A plus B. What that says is by definition, it says when you have that, you're going to write now, write the object we have, the two by two rectangular arrays. Now what that says is, and we call it coordinate wise addition. So what that means is you're gonna add corresponding coordinates. This by definition says you add A11 to B11, you add A12 to B12, you add A21 to B21, and you add A22 to B22. That says technically this will be 0 plus 7, 1 plus 5, 2 plus 3, 3 plus 2, which is commutative. Therefore, we get 7, 6, 5, 5 is the outcome. This is how we add, yeah, not so bad. You're gonna like scalar multiplication also, and then you can combine them, you're like, this is awesome. And then wait till you see the next video when we do matrix multiplication, not so fun. Two, two B. You're like, what do I do? Well, now we know what B is, it's this avatar. So put that there as your first stage. Scalar multiplication is going to be the same for geometric vectors in chapter three and four as well. So let's do it right now for matrices. This is what we call coordinate wise also, which means it goes on to every coordinate. You, multi you double every coordinate in this case. What that means is by definition is, this is two times seven, two times five, two times three, and two times two. We get to do Barney math, four, two times two is four. Two times seven is 14, 10, six, four. This is how you double a matrix. And then how do we do this one step at a time? We're just combining the algebra. Eventually, what we'll, remember the goal of this chapter, the second goal is to view linear systems as matrix multiplication and matrix arithmetic, and we want to solve for a matrix X in a matrix equation, so we have to get all the algebra and definitions first. Now, when we want to start doing some more complicated algebra with this, we have A plus 2B is going to equal what? Work smart, not hard. I already know what A is. That's 0, 1, 2, 3 plus two times seven, five, three, two, which is equal to, I've already computed that is what I'm saying. That's zero, one, two, three, plus this guy, 14, 10, six, four. And then when you see what you're doing, yes, you're allowed to do it in your head. This will be the outcome. I'm not gonna write the stage because I run out of room. Otherwise I have to write on Rasmutin and we don't wanna do that. Can't kill the guy. Yeah, you can. Just is harder than they thought. 11. 2 plus 6 is 8, and 3 plus 4 is 7. That's how you start combining matrices. Now let's do the zero matrix, the scalar identity, and how we use all of these, and then we'll list the 10 axioms to make this thing a vector space. 
right now we're going to have quickly intuitive these ones are fairly intuitive the zero matrix is of size m by n is the m by n rectangular array consisting of all its zeros and we're going to denote it by zero or zero mn we want a slightly different notation because it's not the number zero which is just a real number this is the matrix which is an array of a bunch of zeros if there's the what is that that's the two by three zero matrix so that's zero two by three that's what we mean by that then this one is what you think <laughs> this is the number one in r the scalar identity is the real number one we have a multiplying matrices by real numbers and we want a number that will leave everybody al matrices alone when we do that and we want a matrix when we add two matrices together we want a matrix which leaves every matrix alone when we try to add them together those are called identities the goal now is to take this set of all m by n matrices matrix addition scalar multiplication of a matrix times a real number this object called the zero matrix and the scalar identity one and then we define 10 properties that make this object into what we call a vector space. And that's essentially the definition of a vector space. A vector space is any object, set of objects with two binary operations called addition and scalar multiplication, which have a zero and a scalar identity. And that will create uh, 10 properties. If you have any kind of object that does that, we call that a vector space. What are those 10 axioms? Here we go, we're gonna list them now. Basically we'll phrase this as a theorem. The set of all m by n matrices together with addition and scalar multiplication and this object we call zero and the scalar identity one is what we call a vector space, i.e. we have 10 properties. The first five properties deal with addition, our linear operation of addition, which is dealing with two matrices of the same size. This next five axioms or statements properties that we can prove are going to be dealing with scalar multiplication which deals with one matrix and a number which we multiply together in a way. In the next video we're going to deal with something else which is even more confusing which is truly multiplying two matrices together which has nothing to do with the vector space structure. It's going to have to do with solving and use finding that this is the additive inverse of a matrix we'll get into in a second. The next video will deal with multiplication and the multiplicative inverse A minus 1 when that exists and how we find it to solve linear systems. For now, this is the vector space structure of matrices. The first one says that A plus B doesn't create a new ma matrix of another size. It says that A plus B will be the same size. That's right in the definition. This is called additive commutativity. What it says is you can add A plus B or B plus A. You can interchange the order and that doesn't matter. You'll see with multiplication, it does matter. A times B does not equal B times A in general. This is called additive associativity. They've all got a fancy name. I'm just going to say them once. This is additive closure of matrices. This is additive commutativity. This is additive associativity. This is the additive identity or the zero matrix. What that says is that zero leaves everybody alone when you add. And finally, this is the additive inverse or what we call the negative usually. And what that says is if you add A to its negative, who is all negative entries, you're going to get the zero matrix. Now those axioms are going to be with a matrix and a number, which is dealing with our scalar multiplication operation, and then dealing with these ones actually also deal with combining them. So six says, again, closure of scalar multiplication. It doesn't create a new matrix of any size. It creates a matrix of the same size when you scalar multiply into all the coordinates. Then what we're saying is you can move everything to the front. We'll show as I go along in specific examples and when it comes up, I'll remind you that when you want to now make algebraic moves with addition and scalar multiplication of matrices and you have formulas or any kind of thing that you're trying to use, these are the only moves you're allowed to use. You can't use anything else. What that says is if you have seven times, eight times a matrix, you can do pull the seven times the eight in the front and then compute the things and then multiply that back in. They're going to help us with algebra. What 8 says is you can distribute a number onto the sum of two matrices. So what the left-hand side says is you could add the matrices first with our definition and then scalar multiply it. Or the right-hand says you could scalar multiply A by K, you could scalar multiply B by K, and then add those two matrices. And that's saying that's the same. I know there's a whole lot more there than you think. This one's saying the reverse. You can distribute a matrix onto two numbers. Here you could add the numbers and then scalar multiply, or you could scalar multiply 
a by k, scalar multiply a by l, then add those two matrices, you get the same outcome, distributive properties. And this is the scalar identity. One leaves all the matrices alone. These 10 axioms create a vector space. Anytime you can create an object, an addition, a scalar multiplication, a zero object with the addition, and a scalar identity, usually the number one over r, then if you can satisfy these 10 axioms, this is what we call a vector space in any context. Let's do a couple examples. I know, I know, this is the good part. We got vector spaces. And we're just going to show them that everything you were using was a vector space. Wax on, wax off. I know we were doing karate already. Go do karate, Katie. Example two is going to be some examples of vector spaces so your mind can picture this. Essentially, through the whole course as I go, and we get these new objects, depending on how far down the rabbit hole we go, we're trying to mimic always to the first one that you should know is a vector space. This is how we started phrasing vector space. This guy seems to have a nice, a bunch of nice properties. When we start making new mathematical objects, like the set of all matrices, or the set of all vectors in Rn, or the set of all continuous functions or something, just a second, we'll get into those, then we're going to show in other ways that what's going to happen. We're going to start saying, how do you add them to functions? And you've done that in Calculus 114. If you've seen, go look at the videos under Calculus in my section. We know that functions can be added together if we have two of them. We can take a function and multiply it by a scalar. We can do that. Oh, so we have two binary operations of an addition of two functions and a scalar multiplication of two functions. Therefore, we can show that it has all these properties and therefore we can turn it into a vector space. Anytime you get in a set of objects, you want to find an, an adding of the two objects and multiplying those objects by numbers which we call scalar multiplication. Once you can do that, anything that you can phrase that way is definitely going to be what we call a vector space. The first one is the real numbers with regular addition of two numbers and scalar multiplication, which is regular multiplication. This will look weird in a second, I'll point it out. But this guy now is the vector space over itself. <laughs> so R is viewed as a vector space over itself. We're not gonna get into it any more than that. <laughs> It'll look weird here. For the other ones, addition will look the same. The first five axioms should be about addition. When you add two real numbers, it doesn't create any new kind of number. This is not true for if you take, say, uh, positive integers and you subtract them from each other. Two minus three is not a positive integer, so it didn't create one of those again. You can break these rules with other operations. This one's good. It doesn't matter whether I add two plus three or three plus two, I'm still gonna get the integer five that I'm gonna create from that scenario. When I add, three numbers, two at a time. It doesn't matter whether you start at the front or the back. This one nobody ever thinks about, but what that's saying is if I list this with no brackets, how does your brain actually compute that? Do you actually do two, three, five, eight? No, your brain either lumps, or see, I got it wrong trying to do it. <laughs> either your brain groups it together as two plus two is five, and then plus five is 10. Or what it's saying is you could have grouped that as the three plus five, which will be two plus eight, which is 10. There's an intermediate step, which your brain is just already automatically computing at this stage. This is associativity. You can start at the front or you can start at the back. It doesn't matter. What this one's saying is there's a number zero, which leaves everybody alone. Zero plus A is zero for every number. And as soon as you have that, what we want is the additive inverse or the negative, which says, is there a guy which when I add it to A, I would get exactly nothing. And yes, that's called the negative. So A plus negative A is zero. Then the other five axioms from six to 10 are going to be this scalar multiplication is regular multiplication now. So we have closure of real numbers. When I multiply two times three, I get another number six this time, not five, but it still created a real number, not nothing new. When I take three of them, two at a time. It doesn't matter whether I start at the front or the back. I have associativity of multiplication. Then we need two operations to see how we add and, or combine adding and multiplying. It says you can distribute A on from the left or you can distribute A from the right. So we call these classically left and right distribution. And then there is a multiplicative identity or a one, which leaves everybody alone. These are the exact same axioms and this is actually what we knew ahead of time investigating the real numbers this is how we knew to try and mimic and create him into what we just did and showed in the theorem that he's a vector space we created a set of objects r or m then we said what is adding you have to figure out what adding is in grade school then you know you have to figure out what multiplying is in grade school then you know once you know that you say oh is there a zero yeah is there a one yeah we're off to the races all these things are true vector space
R is a vector space with addition and regular multiplication. This one we just saw, the set of all n by n matrices, is a vector space. Rn, which we're going to get into in chapter 3 and 4, geometric vectors of dimension n. R, we're going to write them like this. Technically, they're just a sub-vector space of this one because we can view these as uh, n by 1 matrices. This is n rows and one column. But these are a vector space. We're going to go through it entirely, and we'll see that this has all those these axioms phrased in with these objects. Vector space. And here's a weird one that we may or may not get into in this course, in the introductory one, but definitely in linear algebra two, we're going to talk about functions and continuous functions, dif differentiable functions, and those create a vector space. What's my object? Functions, which are continuous. Then we say, can you add two functions? Yes. Can you multiply functions by a scalar? Yes. Do we have all these 10 axioms? Turns out, yes, we do. Therefore, we can call this the set of all continuous functions over an interval a, b, a vector space. This is what we're going to do in the course behind the scenes. This is one of the major motivations. Every time we define a new object, we want to find an addition of those objects and a scalar multiplication of, of those objects and show that when we do these properties, we're creating a vector space. In the next video, though, we're going to now switch gears entirely into fifth year and do matrix multiplication, which is now going to be another operation which truly takes two matrices of different sizes, and they're only well posed in certain scenarios. When the number of columns in A matches the number of rows in B, then it's posed, and the matrix that we get from this outcome is of size M by N, the number of rows in A and the number of columns in N are in B. What? A bunch of much more difficult binary operation that we're going to construct. And then we'll see that these properties start slightly differing from the real numbers when we try to look at A times B equals B times A. This will not be true that we can flip it and that's why it's not listed in this, these axioms. Please subscribe right here. You'll get to see noodles a lot more. And in the next video, you'll get to see how we do matrix multiplication. See you next time. Kitty drop. No, don't do that.